called. <laughs> we went from record breaking warm, wouldn't say heat, but uh, yesterday was record breaking cold. So we were doing really warm for that time of the year to really cold for that time of the year. So, yeah. I don't know, 13, 16 when he woke up. I remember being 13 somewhere degrees Fahrenheit. So, yeah, pretty cold. When I was uh, maybe sixth or seventh grade, there was a cold, cold snap where it got down to negative 30 degrees. Uh, for two days in a row, like one negative 33 and night one negative 31. This is in Delta, Utah. And um, yeah, pipes were busting all over the place. It was crazy. But I didn't really understand at the time just how cold it was. They, you know, they canceled school. And I went out to, to collect for my paper out. I had a paper out. And once a month, I had to go collect the money from the people I delivered paper to. And it was sunny. You know, the, the sun was out, no clouds. And I threw on my jacket and my gloves and went out there and I was freezing. It was, just, it was like so cold and I couldn't, I, was, I just thought I was a wimp that day. I was like, I can't understand this. So I went home just after a few houses and uh, found out it was like two degrees below zero <laughs> in the middle of the day still. But it looked like it was 40, you know, it looked exactly the same as if it was 40 degrees. But. Not the same. So we had a uh, we had a missionary from Alaska serving in our ward at our stake, and he spoke in church yesterday. And he's like, "I'm sorry, but I've been praying for this weather. I feel so at home now." So it's his fault. We do need moisture. We have been really, really dry. We certainly need moisture. So I hope we get a lot more snow and rain. Okay, uh, who'd like to start us off with a prayer? Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Okay, what did you guys think about the devotional with President Oaks? Any comments or questions about that? Uh, not questions. Any comments about that? Okay, my comment was it was a good continuation of his talk from General Conference. I agree. Okay, other comments? Yes. I thought it was cool when he was talking about how like we should still honor like the founding fathers of America, even though you know they were facing different historical side effects, but they did lay the foundation. So I just was thinking so that we could have more freedom on the road. So that was a cool thought. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that comment was about we should still she liked the thought that we should still honor our founding fathers. They were in a different different context, but they still laid the foundation for our current uh, our current freedoms. Um, for me, I just the principle of uh, kind of you'll be judged the way that you judge. I mean, if we if we apply our what we know and our standards to people in the past, um, then what's to keep people in the future from doing their same thing to judge us, you know, and, and you think just to be kind, give them the benefit of the doubt. And like, if we're going to pull down statues of people for what they did. Uh, okay, let he who he or she with who is without sin, let them first cast the stone at the statue. I don't know, you know, like, have we all done things that we're, we wish we never we wish we didn't do. So it's a really good talk. If you didn't uh, listen to it, please do. 
I spent some time talk at the beginning talking about anxiety. Um, and that part was good. I don't, I can't summarize it really well, but um, uh, he did give an experience of a student here who was anxious, but started to doubt his anxiety and realized that the things he was, he was anxious about, um, not being good enough, not being able to fulfill the program, not being able to excel in his, his, um, in his future field of endeavor, started to realize, hey, that's, that is, uh, I am good enough. I am doing fine. I'll just keep working and plodding forward. Um, I had, I had some of that when I was in, when I was in college, uh, I didn't think I was smart enough to be a mechanical engineer. And turns out I was, I could have a bit done mechanical engineering, but some of the things I heard what people did, I was like, oh, that's so scary. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Well, yeah, you don't know anything about that. That's why you take the classes and you learn. And turns out I love a lot of the stuff now that I've learned. Uh, I would, I would have loved doing those in the engineering type things. I'm, I'm really an engineer at heart, I found out. But, so have faith, don't doubt yourself. Okay, take a couple minutes and, and work on these problems. So uh, find the determinants, there's three matrices and um, find the, the cofactor of entry two one for that second matrix. I'm gonna start working on the finding the deter determinant of that first matrix. So if you're working on it, don't look up here.
All right, let's start talking. You didn't pay tuition to just sit there and watch me. Okay. Um, so just starting off this first one. So today is really about how to compute determinants and also about what they represent, what they mean uh, geometrically. The book doesn't talk anything about what they mean geometrically. It's kind of silly, um, but uh, we'll talk, spend some time talking about that. So um, just finding the determinants of this, there's two ways. Um, this is one, if you've had a, a unit on matrices before and determinants, then you, your teacher probably taught you this. Um, for, this only works for a three by three, okay? So we have a special way for a two by two, multiply the down the diagonal, subtract the, the product going up the diagonal. That's just for a two by two. This only works for a three by three. So what you do is you write down the, it's, uh, write down the first and the second rows again, and then you take the three diagonals, starting with your each entry of the first row, and you go down to your right, you multiply each of those, to those, and you're gonna add those up, and then you subtract these, uh, starting with your bottom row, these three entries, you take the diagonals on the way up, and you, you take the products and you subtract those. Again, that's only works for a three by three. Once we go to a four by four, you've got to do something different. There's a form, the, we have to do the cofactor expansion beyond that. Um, so here, two times zero is times zero, I get zero. One times one times a minus three, I get a minus three. Five times three times one, I get 15. And I have to subtract these products. A negative three times zero times five, just going to be zero. One times one times two, subtract two. 0 times 3 times 1 is going to just be 0. So I just have a negative 3, 15, and a negative 2, add up to 10. Did I do that right? Did you guys get 10? OK, some of you did. So maybe we're all wrong together. Who knows? OK. Um, we should watch Stand and Deliver. You guys know the movie Stand and Deliver? Some of you are putting your hands. It's about a teacher who taught calculus in, in poor areas of Southern California and got these a lot of minorities that actually passed the AP exam, but he actually taught them some things wrong, incorrectly and they all made the same mistakes on the on the AP exam and they were accused of cheating, partially because this fits perfectly well with uh, with Eller Oaks's talk, but because they were poor and Hispanic, most of them were Hispanic, that they people like that didn't do well on the AP exam, so they must have cheated. So really good movie, really, really good, movie. true story too. Okay, uh, so this is the cofactor expansion. So with the cofactor expansion, we're going to take any row or column. I, if there's rows or columns with zeros or a lot of zeros, pick that one. So, um, so I just picked this, I just picked this one and for the cofactor expansion, there's also, um, you have to do some sign changing. So there's another matrix you can think about that's just about signs. You start with positive here, negative, positive, negative, et cetera, negative, positive, negative, et cetera. Okay, kind of a checkerboard pattern. Okay, um, this is equivalent to a minus one to the I plus J. So if you add the, the row and the column and you add them up and you take a minus one to that power, you'll get positive ones where I've indicated and negative ones where you have indicated. So, um, so these, these, these uh, signs are what, what I have to change for negative there. This, is a positive, but I didn't didn't put it there because on this for this cofactor expansion, I need to. I'm picking. We're only dealing with a three by three. I have to go negative, positive, negative. So the way it works is I take my sign, multiply it by my first number in my row, and then I multiply it by uh, the matrix that I get by deleting the row and column. 
from that number. So I end up with a three one minus three zero. I take that times the determinant of this plus, and then my next one zero associated with the positive. So I'm adding the zero times the determinant or I delete the row and column two five minus three zero. And then this, this one right here, negative subtract. So this minus one times this gives me my, this negative here is my net minus one. And then I delete that row and that column and I get two, five, three, one, two, five, three, one. And then I just, I find the determinant of each of these. If we are doing a four by four, then each of these would be a three by three. And I could do cofactor expansion again, or then I can do this strategy. Okay. So we better get the same thing here. Um, I'm going to get zero minus three, a minus three times a minus one is going to be a positive three. This is just going to be zero because that's zero. Here I'm going to get a minus one, two times uh, two minus 15 is a minus 13, but I need to multiply that by the minus one. So I end up with something's wrong here. The three should be a negative. There we go. Because, oh, all right, so zero minus, yeah, this is minus a negative three and then multiply by that minus one. Thanks. So, and so here we end up with a positive 13 minus three. We get 10. So if you can handle the triple negative, you get a 10. So too much for me to handle. Okay, so questions about finding determinants like so. Okay, so fun. Okay, this is not why anyone goes into math. Okay, so, but you have anticipated me. Good job. Um, so, how about the determinant for this next one, this diagonal matrix? Andrew says 15, why 15? So I think you're doing it. A, so um, yeah, you're doing the basis for the proof of the theorem that you guys would hopefully read about in the book, which is how, what's the determinant of a triangular matrix? It's the it's the the di the, the product of the diagonal entries. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Were you talking about this? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> okay. So that was my okay. That's my bad. It is the second one up here. So that was my, my bad. So yeah, so this one up here, we have a four by four triangular matrix. It's 15, also happens to be 15. Right? So how do I pick them poorly? So, okay. Um, so you have a triangular matrix. The product is just down the diagonal. Um, when I did show that or to prove it, we, we won't do the generic proof where we could, but in this case, I'm going to expand along, I'm going to do cofactor expansion. So I'm going to get um, a positive one times, I'm just going to pick the first, the first column. So then I get five, eight, one, zero, three, two, zero, zero, one. Okay, so it's a one times this, but now I'm going to do cofactor expansion again. And I'm going to pick this, this first column. So then that just becomes a one times a five. The diagonal entries, when you do cofactor expansion, are always positive. Okay, so we don't have to worry about sign changing here. Five, eliminate row and column, three, two, zero, one. Well, I can do expand again here, or I can just do my three times one minus zero, either way. I end up with one times five times three times one. And you can do that generically for, for any arbitrarily sized matrix. So you just multiply down the diagonals. Okay, and how about this last one? What's the determinant of, of this third 
this third four by four matrix up on the well, it's the second four by four matrix, but the third matrix. So we're trying to find the determinant of in the first problem. We're trying to clarify where we all are. What's the determinant here? Zero. Y zero. You have a whole column of zeros. Just pick that to expand on. You're going to have zero times some something zero. You're going to have a uh, yeah, like zero times the cofactor. Oh, where's my cofactor one? Yeah, zero times the submatrix, zero times the submatrix, zero times the submatrix. You're just going to end up with zero. So, okay. Nice. Um, any questions about number one here? Yes, in the back. No, sorry. The other person in the very back. Oh, so the question was that there's no such thing as a determinant for a matrix that has linearly dependent columns. There is such thing, it's just zero. So the determinant, if you have linearly dependent columns, then, um, or rows, we know those are the same, then the determinant will be zero. So, yep. And we'll talk about why. Uh, well, one way to see that is to understand what determinants represent geometrically, and we're going to get to that. But yeah, great. Great point. So, uh, yes, right here. Here, give it to me. What is it? Okay, so this is um. That this probably should have been a problem that was on the ne on the next web assignment for the second half. So this this has to do with um, with yeah the determinants. Well, no, you guys didn't you guys read determinants of elementary matrices? Yeah. So so if you read determinants of elementary matrices, then we know that uh, th well, there's three kinds of elementary matrices, right? You can switch a row, switch any two rows, and that's what happens here. And if A and B are two matrices where B is just the same as A except a row is switched, then the determinant of A is a minus the determinant of B. So if you take if you just switch any two rows in any matrix, you just change the sign of the matrix of the determinant. So um, switch. It's got to be a C in there somewhere. <laughs> that, that's right, TCH. Gosh, that's so bad. Um, so, uh, what about multiply one row by a value k, a scalar k? Then, how do you think this changes, or what did you read about? Um, if the um, we have one matrix A and B is this is A just with one row. So if I take A, multiply one row or column, I guess we're just talking row operations. So multiply one row by K, then what's the relationship of these? The determinant of A is what? The determinant of B. So What's the relationship between those? They're not equal. Yeah, this is going to take, you need this k times as much to equal the determinant of b. Here, here's an example.
So, except that's a column. Boy, that's not going to help very much when we're talking about row operations. Two, two. Okay. So if I, I multiply this row by two, well, if I expand along that row, I'm going to get two A times its submatrix minus two D times its submatrix and two G times its submatrix. Okay, I'm not gonna write down the submatrices there because we're okay with that. Oh, maybe I should do one. So this is E H F I. Maybe I should do all of them. So eliminate those. This is gonna be B H C I. B H C I. And then this is going to be B E C F. These all seem like Fortune 500 companies or something. You know, initials. Um, well, look, we could factor out a two from all of these. So that's just get a different color here. Perfect. That's the same as two times all of that. But what's all of this now? That's exactly the determinant of the matrix if I didn't multiply twos in and expand it along this first row. Like it would have taken A times its submatrix, just uh, subtract D times its submatrix, the determinant of its submatrix, and G times the determinant of its submatrix. So, so now this is two times the determinant of our of just A, A D G B E H C F I. The determinant of this is just that stuff. So if I take a row um, and multiply by a constant, that's the same as just taking that constant and multiplying by the determinant of the matrix in the first place. Okay. Not getting you know much. I can't tell if you guys are lost. Not a lot of head shaking. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So um, he said he got lost because I thought you, could, you, you had to pick one column. You can pick a row or a column. Yeah, so great. I'm glad you brought that up. You can pick any row or column and do the expansion. So it's really cool. So you, that gives you some flexibility to, to pick one that you're gonna, gonna work with. So Grant, did you have a question? You'll hold off. Okay, other questions or comments? We haven't got to the last row or, or things about elementary matrices yet, but. Okay, yeah, I was gonna do this later on, but uh, we may as well finish right now. Three, if you, Add um, uh, if you add a multiple of one row, to another, then what does that do? Nothing doesn't change the determinant at all. If you take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, keep the determinant stays the same. So, so these are really rules. I haven't done these in terms of elementary matrices. These are really done rules in terms of row operations. Elementary matrices, we could be more specific. So, so the determinant of this is going to be a minus one because you, with elementary matrices, you always just start with the, I get the you just start with the identity matrix and you do one of these things. So if you have an elementary matrix of type one here, then the determinant of that is going to be a minus one. You have the determinant of, of an elementary matrix of type two. So this is the second one here, then it will just be K. And if you have the determinant of of an element of type three, you're just gonna get one. Because, because the determinant of the identity matrix is one. It's a diagonal matrix. You just multiply all the ones together. It's just one. Yes. Um, nope, switching any two rows. I'm pretty 
Um, I thought so. I thought I was switching any two rows. Isn't that what the book says? I thought I thought that's what I read. We could test, but that's a great question. Like, if you, if if you're unsure, you could easily test that out, right? Take a one zero 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 one zero 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 one. Hey, I'm going to switch these two rows. I get uh, zero zero one zero one zero zero. <laughs> I, ha I have a shrinking transformation that happens the lower I go on the board. So, and then you can figure out if that's really a minus one or if it's a positive one. Like, because we know the determinant of this is a positive one. It's just the identity. We switch two rows. Is this a negative one? And we could test, oh, let's expand along this row. Well, let's, let's expand around this column. This is a positive for in the co in the cofactor sign. I get a positive one times zero minus one. So it ends up being a minus one. So yeah, any two rows, you should be able to prove, we should be able to prove that. Meaning I at least should be able to prove it to you. But I'm, and it would be based off of something like that, I guess. Yes. So her question was, how, do, how are these going to be helpful? Are they just going to already say, hey, the determinant of A is five? Um, you usually don't know the determinant of A to begin with, but for practice to see if you know these properties on a test, they might do that, yes. But what it helps us is, you may have read, if you, if you read the book carefully, you saw that using cofactor expansion, which is what we have to do if we're beyond a three by three, using cofactor expansion takes an incredibly large number of calculations. Incredibly large. Talking about a 50 by 50 matrix, which is not that big, actually. Finding the determinant, if you had a computer that could do a trillion calculations a second, it would still take 10 to the 45th years to do, just to find the determinant of that one matrix. And the whole, the Earth's only existed for 10 to the 10th. We're not even close to 10 to the 45th. I mean, it's just like atrocious. So we have to find some other way to find determinants for large matrices. Um, there are some iterative methods where the computer can help do it, but we can also do real operations to get into something like a triangular matrix, but we change, those op real operations change the determinant or can change the determinant every time. So we have to keep track of those, so then we can find the determinant and figure out, and figure out, you know, if we how many times we change the sign and how many times we multiplied by a, a certain number. So it turns out to be uh, much more efficient to do real operations to get down to a triangular matrix and just keep track of the operations that you did, than actually doing cofactor expansion for large matrices. That's perfect. I prepared to talk about that. Nice job. Perfect. So. Um, there are, I mean, there are the times where you might know, uh, know a matrix and you've done some changes and you're like, well, I don't want to have to calculate the whole thing again. And you can just think about, well, what changes did you make? If you already know how those would change the determinant, it saves you a lot of work. Okay. Yes, Michelle. Oh, are they already wanting to share? You want to share your screen? Yeah, we'll have Michelle share her screen. She just pulled up the properties of the elementary matrices. So there you can see, um, if you interchange two rows of the identity matrix, then the determinant of that new matrix is a minus one. Can you hit control plus a few times? See if that helps to or command plus on yours. Yeah, that might be just as good as we can go. So uh, if E results from multiplying one row of the identity matrix uh, by K, then the determinant of E is K. And if E results from adding a multiple of one row of the identity to another row, then it doesn't change, it does not change. Yes.
Oh, so the question is, shouldn't the K be over here? Um, so um, we this determinant of B will be larger, at least if K is larger than one, we'll think about this case. If K is larger than one, then determinant of, K, of B will be larger. So to, so to make these equal, I have to multiply this side by K. So, so um, if you ask students, write down an equation that captures uh, that captures the fact that there are six times as many professors as there are students. Sorry, there are six times as many students as there are professors. That makes more sense. There are six times as many students as there are professors. Just start. Just write that down. Write down. Write what equation captures there are six times as many students as there are professors. So. Yeah, six times as many students as there are professors. There are more students than professors. Okay. The natural thing, maybe some of you did this, was wrote uh, 6s equals p. But actually, s equals 6p is the appropriate way to do it, this. Because there are more, so there are six times as many students. So to make an equality, I have to, I have to, to make these two values equal, I have to, I have to take the number of professors and multiply those that by six to get to get the number of students. It's a similar thing that's happening here. This is compensating. This k here is compensating for the growth of the determinant of b. We could say, yeah. Um, right. I have to multiply the original a, the determinant of a, that original one by k to get the same determinant as b. Does that make sense, Brad? Thanks. Thanks for raising that. Um, all right, let's talk about, oh, let's, we haven't finished this. So um, what is C21? So this is the cofactor of the entry in the second row for the in the first column. So the cofactor is, the cofactor refers to this entire thing. And it refers to the sign, the value, and the um, the sign, the value, and the determinant of the submatrix. Submatrix. Okay, like all of this. So, if we go back to our thing here, then we have. I want, what is C21? So I go to the second row, first column. So I have three here. What's the sign associated with three? It's gonna be a negative, okay? Because I, I have, I'm in second row, first column, that's an odd, an odd sum of the two one. So I'm going to have minus one to the odd power is a minus one. So I get a minus one times three, and then eliminate the row in the column and I get one times zero, which is zero minus five. So minus three times a minus five is 15. So should be 15. You were right, Andrew. So good job. Any questions about that? Yes. Um, so the minor, the minor is the what I've been calling the submatrix. So the mi so the minor associated with three, I we eliminate the row in the column. It would be the one five one zero. So that's the minor. Okay, I should have called been calling it the minor. So, so um, and the cofactor is all of those things. It's the sign, the val you know the 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 entry, um, and and the determinant of the minor. So that's all of those things. Great question. I should I should call it I should use the same language as the book. So. All right. Let's talk about why we're even finding determinants. Okay. Um, what do they represent? Geometric. So 
geometrically, um, the determinant um, in R2, it represents the area of this parallelogram. So if I have two, two vectors here and I create this parallelogram, so the diagonal would be the first vector plus the second vector, then the determinant tells me this area. Okay, and this is one of the uses. If you know points in space, well, let me, whoops. In, in, in three space, if I have three vectors, okay, if I have three vectors, it tells me the volume of, the, of this, this is called a parallel pipid. Okay, it's a three-dimensional kind of parallelogram thing, a skew, often a skewed, uh, a skewed cube of some sort. So it tells me the volume of these things. So one application determinants is if you actually have coordinates in space, you can turn the coordinates into vectors and then, and then you can do determinants to figure out the, this volume. And then you can chop that up. And if, you're, if you don't care about the whole volume, you might, you might care about a piece of that volume. So um, this, is, this is the proof that if you think about it in terms of an area, it is AD minus BC. This is a geometric proof. Um, it's not the easiest to see, but here, here we have the, what we want to figure out, right? But we want to know the area of this, okay? And if you slide this green piece down, then you get, then you get the two green pieces make a rectangle. And if you slide this over here, then you get this rectangle. And then all of the white becomes uh, this uh, rectangle, but that white starts off as um, that. This white has uh, this parallelogram, which is what we want, but also this rectangle right up here, CB. We can see over here that the the whole white is A times D, but it's CB too much. We don't want all that. We just want this part but CV is also captured in here. So you have to subtract off CV. So to get the area of the parallelogram. So I think it's kind of cool that such a simple calculation gets you a crazy area like that. You're not finding heights, right? You're not using cosine anywhere to do anything with the angles. AD minus BC, pretty, pretty cool. Okay, I don't think we're going to uh, do that example. If you if you if you go to if you Google and find the Wolfram Alpha demonstration, you can like change the values of the matrix and you can see how it changes and you can see how the volume changes. That's what I was going to do, but we're running out of time. Um, okay, everyone, watch this for a minute. Try to figure out what's going on. Oops. Five geometric shapes. One way you rearrange them, you make a triangle with 51 and a half area. You rearrange them differently, you get a triangle with 52 and a half. And that black square, it's like, hey, we've got, see there, 51 and a half area rearranged. Now you've got a triangle with 52 and a half. You got more area, you got an extra space there. All math is wrong. What is going on here? Back in the corner. Yep, the, the shapes are exactly the same size. Yep, there's, it's not a, no trick like that. The ships, those shapes are exactly the same size. So, yep. Any got an, anyone got an idea here? What is going on?
Where does that, where does that black space go when it's in this situation? Yeah, it just disappears. Joseph? The legs of the triangle? It may look like that they still are supposed to be five and eight. So, like five here, you're still down to five right there. Oh, you mean like this is higher? Okay, so maybe, anyone else got an idea? Okay. Um, huh, Braden, maybe you've been on something? He said it, it is it is it really a straight line? Is it not a straight line from here down to there? Okay. This you can actually use determinants to figure out. Okay. They tell us areas, and so. Um, if that's a straight line, then we make when we make our two vectors, then the determinant better come out to be zero, because both both vectors should be on this exact same line. They don't make any, they don't make a graph a parallelogram with any area. Okay, so I'm going to. So I'm thinking about um, think about it like this. So I'm going to think about this as the origin. Okay, so I have to turn these, I'm not thinking about points, I have to put, turn them into vectors, okay? So I'm thinking I'm going to go from here to here for one, and here all the way up to there for our other one, okay? And this is a, this is three, this is five, this is eight, this is five. Okay, did we get that right? Can you go back? I'm pretty sure you have five. The green is five and three. The other one is eight and five. So what's this vector that goes from zero, zero to the point five, three, five, three. And then this vector that goes from zero to this corner, that's a total of eight and three. So that's, that's uh, 13, eight. They are not collinear. That is not a triangle. And so if you are actually to draw a line, pull that up again. This is, this is actually bumped up a little more. This actually is sucked in from the line a little bit. And if you actually connect this point to this point, then when it's in this situation, there is a half a unit area that is, um, less than the triangle. And when it's in this position, there's a half unit more the area. The line would come a little less than that. Oh, wait for a second. So the line, oh, here, yeah, watch this point. Look, the, it goes from that point, but now look where the intersection is. It's down a little bit. See that? Up, down. So, so I'm going to exaggerate this just a little bit. So, um, if, you, if I do it like this, oh, that's not exaggerated very much. So, um, I'll do it this way, okay? Then when I draw that line, I'm, I, there's, a, there's a triangle like that. And the parallel pipette that I'm looking at is actually that one. And that total area of the parallel pipette is 
is one. And when you cut it off there, you're at half. So one's a half larger than the triangle, one's a half less than the triangle. And that's why you end up with a unit difference. You can make, you can make this trick with any sequence, with any three numbers of a certain sequence. Anyone recognize these numbers? They're Fibonacci numbers. So the Fibonacci number starts off with one, one, three, and then you add the two, not two, one, one, and then you add the, the, the two before it to get the third, five, eight, 13. This uses uh, three, five, eight, and eight, 13 is tight in there. And these are pretty close. And in fact, the ratio of any two numbers here, eight to five and 13 to eight, and 20, 21 to 13, those ratios all get closer and closer and closer to the golden ratio. So, and, and as you go, if you, if you make this same, the same illusion with values further and further down, you still just get one area but it's getting, it gets closer and closer and harder to, de harder to detect that difference because they're so close to being a triangle. You can barely tell the difference. All right, have a great day. Go and press your friends. You can just do it with, uh, you can cut out pieces of paper and, uh, and do it with your friends and it's really hard to, to tell. So don't forget your homework, the homework over here. On the reading, there is stuff on adjoint matrices you do not have to know, so you can skip all the stuff about adjoint matrices. Did we record? <laughs>